Damon. Why do we love him? It's strange. He's very clearly flawed. He dances with evil in many dimensions of his being. He can hardly be described as a good character. The first episodes open with him as the clearest villain, in direct and regular opposition of his brother, sowing constant discord, disdaining his name and responsibility, soiling the image of his house. When he takes the gold cloaks out to cleanse the city, it's for clear political purposes, but the brunt of the scenes were given emphasize how he seems to enjoy the pure cruelty and barbarity of it. Now, he's clearly not all evil in the way of Ramsay Bolton or Sir Marin Trant or some of the other more flat characters from Game of Thrones. Even in the first few scenes, the scripting is very careful, and joined with Matt Smith's excellent portrayal, Damon manages to hook us right away. First, of course, we meet him through the eyes of Rhaenyra, who's already become a empathetic and resonant anchor, sort of the anchor for the audience. She's not only the clearest protagonist early on, but somewhat purely protagonistic. Again, as with Game of Thrones, this story revolves heavily around children, and generating empathy or emotional resonance with them early on is always going to be a bit easier than doing the same for fully established adults. At the beginning, at least. After Joffrey dies and we dive into Cersei's suffering, we start to appreciate her struggle more. Same with Daemon. Once we spend more time with him, we start to appreciate him. I'd say the first two to four episodes were drawn largely by his charisma and his courage, and the simple fact that he's a foil to Viserys' clear weakness. As the season advances, though, all of that is fleshed out. We appreciate the sacrifices he makes. We appreciate that his charisma is born of suffering and trial. He's earned it. He's been doomed simply by coincidence of birth to live in his brother's shadow. I will speak of my brother as I wish. You will not. He's a man so obviously seeking a cause, seeking some vision to throw himself behind. Yet everywhere he turns, he sees a world dominated by the visions of weaker men. The men who pull the strings of the realm are themselves like puppets, posturing hollowly for power. He sees his brother suffering beneath the crown, and he both pities and resents him for it. Then there's Rhaenyra. It's obvious from the start he sees something of himself in her. Maybe his attraction for her is in the end nothing but a reflective sort of narcissism, maybe much like Cersei's love for Jaime or her children. But Damon's love, at least thus far, seems more true because he's clearly a man who's gone out into the world and carved his way. He's flown into battle for his brother. He sat in essential exile at Dragonstone. He risks his life against the crab feeder, and when they start to hail him as King of the Narrow Sea, he rejects the crown it likely could have won him. Of course, he does wear the crown before Viserys, and before the court. It's only in the public eye that he takes it off, and offers it his brother, planting an audacious seed and sending a distinct message. But that's the beauty of Damon as a character, the layers. Every action, every line, it has many possible interpretations, many possible motivations, many actual motivations. Wed her to me. When I offered up my crown, you said I could have anything. I want Rhaenyra. I take her as she is and wed her in the tradition of our house. We're witness to the fact that he's very much on a journey, struggling to shape and discover himself even as we discover alongside him. He's torn, torn between a dozen shifting loyalties, torn between a lust for power and the genuine truth that he could stabilize the realm better than many other potential rulers, better than his brother. You're weak, Viserys. Look at his relationships. He can either honor his brother and accept the rule of the gold cloaks meekly and thus show unity before the realm, or he can take the men on their cleansing crusade, undermining his brother, terrifying the city, but perhaps bringing greater stability through his strength. You might know this unless you left the safety of the Red Keep, but much of King's Landing is seen by the small folk as lawless and terrifying. He can find a noble woman, marry, continue the line, content himself with a lesser role, or he can stay with Messaria for love and embrace the inevitable chaos that will cause. He could have tried to reconcile with his first wife. Given her children, he could have seen the veil strengthened. Before ever flying to the Stepstones, he could have submitted to his brother, shown unity, left them to be overrun. Why did he fly out to fight? Certainly some part of it was for the personal popularity, the glory. Some part of it seems to be the simple fact that he's useless and unwanted in King's Landing. Some part of it might be a genuine wish for peace. 
That's what's so fascinating about characters like this. Consider the context in which he's introduced. God be good. It's all right, sir. Sparo to rivo se gauma kepus. No oso dime. Kesi no os demi vos majlario sinus. Do hem palit not stati lux da or. En sin drasma koda brima sto da or. Eh. Karjba gieri ti dem koisa. Se paves o go scorio sit masta. Ke po e ua uno sud kotion tradila rupta. Kotio drama sit isa. It's a perfect illustration of a scene. He's sitting on the throne. Whenever that happens in movies, we know what it's about. He wants it. He's the brother, the unlucky younger brother, and he wants the throne. Then we quickly see that Rhaenyra likes him, and so we're thrown into a bit of doubt. We drag him helplessly into a more favorable light. If Rhaenyra likes him, there must be something to like. They ride and speak with dragons. They both speak in High Valyrian, which automatically makes them more magnetic. It's like, okay, these two have something of the old ways in them. The others have forgotten their legacy, forgotten who they are. But these two, they have that wild side, that primal connection, that resonance with the past. There's this classic corruption explored in many stories that comes with too much softness and too much comfort, too much time and power, too much peace. It's sort of like a civilization-wide reflection of the overprotective mother trope. I'm doing a video on that, so check the link in the description. But it's basically the shortcoming of every spoiled prince or princess. It's Viserys getting sliced and sick upon the throne. It's the mad king twisted and dragonless, laughing in the hell he's created of a once great kingdom. It's all the southern realms, grown soft and forgetting the white walkers and the wall. It's the forgetting of true stories. It's in every fantasy novel. But the years passed golden, full of peace and plenty. The stories of grandfathers, once told from an armchair with a rusty sword in hand, faded into tale and even into song. They became things told by tavern light to fiddler's music, told as legend rather than true heritage. The beasts and foul things were shattered, chased into the deep places of the earth, and there they lurked and were forgotten, and their names became only simple things. Not curses to set men pale and trembling, but jests used to frighten children when they would not obey. And the wild of the forest was abandoned, and it grew, and it had nothing to do with the roads and cities frequented by men. And sure, in the fastness of the reaches, or the dark nights of terrible storm, sure then they would spin the tales by tavern light, or perhaps a sailor or two would utter a prayer. But times were good, and what need to look for evil? And so the royals grow soft and begin to laugh. They outlaw magic. They turn to science, canals, laws. And what happens? Darkness grows in hidden places. And at first it's ignored. Then people start to notice. It starts to creep into the fringes. The hidden mountain villages. The rents where the border between man and myth or man and fae grows weak. There starts to be some potency once more in sailors' songs and wives' tales. The seers speak black omens. Crops fail. We hear this over and over and over again. And winter is coming. 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 And winter is coming. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Then it comes when the people are soft and unready. It's an old story because it's one of the true stories. One of the stories that manifests in each individual life. It's in the Bible over and over and over again. It's somewhat linked to this motif we see in mythology, in which a grandfather generation of gods is overthrown by their children, who are more wakeful, more conscious, more human than them in some ways. There are other complexities involved in that, of course, and I'll link a video on that when finished. But the point is that if the ruling house grows careless, they lose touch with the gritty heartbeat of reality. They become too tangled up with the idea of themselves. They become precarious. Damon hasn't forgotten. Damon isn't precarious. And the blood of the dragon runs thick. And if Rhaenyra likes him, there must be something to like. He brings her gifts. He makes her smile. They share an ancient tongue. It's made quite clear that he's the more fiery of the brothers, the more self-actualized, the more courageous, the more his own. He sees this in Rhaenyra, even in her youth, and he admires it. 
She sees in him the strength her father lacks, and this strange dimension of personal care which we don't really see from her father, at least not after he starts to mourn the death of his wife. Her father expresses concern and compassion and tenderness, but Damon feels as if he sees Rhaenyra. He sees her wildness. He sees the Rhaenyra of dragonback and freedom. He sees her metal. He sees her fire. All the things that grate at her father and the role he wants to impose upon her, all of these things are the things that Damon loves. This is interesting because it's not that Damon has the true and virtuous vision of Rhaenyra, and Viserys has the weak and selfish one. It's not that simple. Wedded to me. When I offered up my crown, you said I could have anything. I want Rhaenyra. I take her as she is and wed her in the tradition of our house. You are already wed. That didn't stop Egg on the Conqueror from taking a second wife. You are no conqueror. You are a plague. Sent to destroy me. Give me Rhaenyra to take to wife. And we will return the House of the Dragon to its proper glory. Damon sees in her the traits her father lacks, and he sees that with them she could become great. This is true. Viserys sees the same traits, but he sees their darker side. Also true. Untempered by things like restraint, duty, adherence to some higher code, she will become like Damon, wild and careless, her great potential twisted awry. Responsibility. I have handed to you the burden of this knowledge. It is larger than the throne, the king. It is larger than you and your desires. Jaehaerys would have disinherited you. For a lie? You've yet to ask me for the truth of what happened. The truth does not matter, Rhaenyra. Only perception. You have exposed yourself. Now we must both suffer the consequences. Were I born a man, I could bear him if I wanted. I could father a dozen bastards, and no one in your court would blink an eye. You're right. But you were born a woman. So you will strip me of my titles and name Egon in my stead. I would. But it is mine to hold the realm together, not sow it with further division. Your courtship is at an end. You will wed Selene of Valarian, and you will do so without protest. The son of the sea snake. So I can be a remedy for your political headaches. You are my political headache. Your wedding to Selena Valarian will unite the two most powerful houses in the realm. With the combined strength of our shared dragons and naval fleets, no one would dare to stand against us. The House of the Dragon will stand as one for a further generation. And what will you do about the vulture who perches upon your throne? What vulture? Your hands. But ambition alone is not what drove him to conquest. It was a dream. And just as Danis foresaw the end of Valyria, Aegon foresaw the end of the world of men. Aegon called his dream the Song of Ice and Fire. This secret, it's been passed from king to heir since Aegon's time. Now you must promise to carry it and protect it. 
promise me this, Ranera. Promise me. Rhaenyra, for her part, has lived the life of her father's daughter. We get the sense that she's had snippets of connection with Daemon, probably mostly in her younger days. He's always celebrated her, inspired her, but he's mostly usually away, going about his business or the king's, and she's seen his darker side probably only vaguely. Her father, on the other hand, has ruled her life. She's been raised up as a princess for a marriage of politics and childbearing. She knows her aunt, probably better suited to the throne, was dismissed in favor of her father due solely to her sex. Even when he declares her his heir, he overlooks her in council. He grows understandably distant and weary at the death of his wife, but she's lost her mother, and rather than turning to her, his daughter, he finds connection in her best friend, Alicent. He spurns a promising alliance with his cousin's house, a house that sits abreast of his in power, and a house that is not forgotten when it nearly won the throne. He does all this, and taking no counsel, he marries his daughter's best friend. It's all understandable, but little wonder that she starts to resent him, to distance herself yet further. So for all that Daemon has his flaws, it's Viserys' flaws which have dominated Rhaenyra's life, and thus it's Daemon to whom she's drawn and Viserys against whom she rebels. Drawn along with Rhaenyra, the most relatable character thus far, it's inevitable that we start to feel the same as she does. Let's go back to this very first scene. Introducing Damon from her perspective rather than his brother's sets this precedent of admiration and desire. It's not clear yet in just what manner she desires him, but his essence is one of promise and freedom and clarity. So we're drawn to him, even as we're introduced to him as a definite and chaotic rival. Very quickly we see he can be violent, dishonorable, selfish. The writing for Damon shows a very good understanding of how humans relate to others, at least to others in the conceptual realm of story. In real life, of course, we're bothered and confused about little details like how someone's less likable features affect us personally. But in story, it can draw us in. And let's be honest, in real life, it can draw us in also. There's a reason pirates and highwaymen and werewolves and vampires are the romantic, mysterious lovers of story. There's a reason for mad, poetic, beautiful seers and seductive enchantresses and all of that. We're drawn to power because it's not only power, but it's competence. It's the having gone down into the cave and faced a monster. It's the having been blinded in one eye, but having won the sight of the future, or the sight of all things hidden. It's the man who's won the names of secret things, yet who's just a touch mad from the knowing of too much. One of the fundamental sort of cornerstones of story, regardless of its medium, is making sure that each scene serves a purpose, that each scene draws us further in and advances the narrative in some way which not only evolves the characters, but also deepens our connection to them. So you have the character, as they are, going into a scene which presents the character with a change in circumstances. The character has to decide how to act, and is forced in a certain direction. This can be envisioned like a multi-forking path in front of you. Each branch changes who you are, changes your surroundings, locks you into a certain set of subsequent branches. Certain branches are in closer alignment, offering possible overlap or reconnection, in terms of future landscape or direction. At a certain point though, your identity and your environment and the set of choices it presents you with change fundamentally, and you can't go back and explore their destinations. What skilled writers do is present us with a choice that, first of all, builds tension in a believable manner. That means the choice has to be consistent with the world building and the character up until that point. The choice has to involve one or more possible rewards and possible costs, and it all has to overlap in a way that contributes believably to the whole of the story and to the emotional weight it carries with the audience. This means that each character should be pushed further into a reality that reflects their choices. There should be a dynamic relationship between who they are becoming and what the world is becoming around them. This means they shouldn't make the choice to act like an entitled brat and still somehow win an alliance with no strings attached. <coughs> it is because of the elves that you were given this island. What? Surely you can spare a few planks and a rudder. What the elf means? Then if blood be the price of passage, I will pay it. But one way or another, I will depart. Then I have little choice but to ask for another. One with Numenor's true ruler. And you should stand aside. Then I might present my proposal to one who holds the authority to answer it. There is a tempest in me, and it will not be quelled by you, Regent.
two hours later. Basically, this is super simple. It's saying choices should have consequences, and consequences should evolve with the characters. That's it. That's the heart of compelling storytelling. It sounds simple, but it's an art. So in each scene, you have the beginning, who the character is, what they want, their powers and weaknesses, and so on. Boom, the scene comes, presents them with an inflection point, and they choose. Then you have the end, their new self, the new future that they face. So what does all this have to do with Damon, and why is he in particular so attractive? Well, a skilled writer will draw the reader in by keeping things unstable. In some ways, it's just like building suspense in the broader sense. There's this inverse relationship between how stable or known a thing can be and how much suspense is felt about it. This is why you have suspense building with the rising action of a novel, but then it sort of crystallizes in the climax. The climax is when the protagonist makes their choice, manifests whatever it is they've become, and pits themselves against the enemy. You look at climaxes in Sanderson or Rothfuss or Tolkien or Martin. Look at Arya Stark. You build up an entire sequence fascinated by the faceless men, marveling as she peels their secrets away one by one. You're in awe of Jack and Hagar. You wonder at his designs. You tremble at the waif and her fiendish guile. You're learning everything with Arya, and it's all new and veiled in mystery. But once she has her abilities, it's become a part of her. She's chosen her path at the fork and it's led her to this place of strange power. But that power is no longer as strange, not unless she's constantly pushing the boundaries of what she knows. So when she goes to Winterfell and we see her through Sansa's eyes, we know a moment of suspense, but it's not really at Arya's abilities, it's at her character. Would she indeed kill her sister? Who is she? Just how much no one has she become, and what does that mean? We've seen her kill Walder Frey, we've seen her face Brienne, She's become a darker, more capable being. The suspense is built, then, around her relationship with Sansa and who they've each become. But as soon as they reveal themselves and slaughter Littlefinger, there's no more suspense there either, because we know who they are. They're allies. Then Jon comes, and Danny comes, and they're all thrust into this new array of roiling tension. This is fairly simple stuff that all of us instinctively know, but it helps to conceptualize clearly like this because it reveals something a bit deeper, about how to write compelling characters. The reason Damon's so compelling is not despite, but because of his dark, dual, dangerous nature. He's introduced from a distance as a man of mystery and chaos and suspense, but he's acted and scripted in such a way that we know there's substance there, and there's substance we can empathize with. He's like the Hound, or Jamie or even Theon. They start out as men much at odds with more established protagonists, but layer by layer, as we spend more time with them, we see the depth and humanity beneath. It's real. That's what it is. It's ambiguous. It's nuanced. When we look at our own selves, it can be hard to honestly pin down exactly why we do what we do, why we want what we want. There are always layers, some good, some bad, and most just confusing. Naturally, it can be even more confusing watching other people from the outside. That's what's so beautiful about television and about Damon. We can't see into his mind. The show doesn't tell us exactly how to feel about him. It just shows him, a beautifully complex and consistent creation, as seen from the outside. As Viserys' weakness continues, the rest of the realm is tangled up in selfishness and betrayal. Characters we care about hurt and are hurt by each other. They find themselves pulled into positions of increasing and inevitable conflict, often due to their own weakness or corruption. But Damon's always true in the sense that he wants what he wants, and he takes it, and he's pure about it. It's not until Rhaenyra's already grown and married and having children out of wedlock and all that that we truly start to suffer from her weaknesses. She becomes a more complex character then, with dimensions of darkness that frustrate us and even begin to warm us to her enemies, to Alicent and the other children. We understand how Aemon and Aegon and all the others might feel slighted or betrayed. Their mother has served the king faithfully these years, given him stability, borne him children under the law. Rhaenyra, on the other hand, has betrayed the match he set for her. She's indulged her impulses, borne the children of her sworn protector. While Alicent has served the crown faithfully, Rhaenyra continues to play careless with her inheritance. Her father broke tradition and invited discord by naming her his heir, and she throws things further towards instability with her rashness. So we start to empathize with the others. 
and with Rhaenyra a bit less. By this time, Damon's already been following his own arc. We've seen his suffering and loneliness. We've seen the risks he takes for Missaria, for Rhaenyra, for the Stepstones, even for his brother. We've seen he does actually care. He marries Lena, probably for mostly political reasons, but we see he tries to be a good father and husband. He's tender, actually. The writers pull us back and forth with this constant contradiction in his scenes, first sentimental and then distant, first earnest and then consumed by ambition. This is the beauty of this tension, this constant building of suspense. We never know for sure what Damon will do, because we don't know the full depth of his motivations, because he doesn't know the full depth of his motivations, because he's developing and evolving even as the story progresses. He's discovering himself alongside us, but he's pure about it. It's refreshing. It's alluring. The most relatable characters are the ones whose ongoing battles speak to us. They resonate with our own inner battles. I think Damon resonates in particular, basically because he's complex. He's complex not only in his motivations, but in how he's portrayed. Many of the characters are, ultimately, a bit more unidimensional. Viserys is sort of dominated by the throne and dominated by the weakness that makes him ill-suited to sit it. He's focused so intently on this prophecy, on his relationship with his daughter, and on overcoming the grief of losing his wife. That's pretty much it. He's a great, complex character, incredible acting, incredible scripting, but he's dominated by these roles that he's thrust into. Rhaenyra is similar. She's the named heir, the daughter of the king. Alicent doesn't really have any agency until she's married, and then she's rather dominated by her resentment for Rhaenyra and her care for her children, and her weariness in her marriage. But Damon is free from these sort of imposed roles. He's thrust into no mold. He sort of flies endlessly around, pursuing in various ways his own growth. While the others tamp down or ignore certain threads that pull at them, he's free to explore every single one. However enigmatic or ambiguous he can be, his journey feels very organic and very complex, and I think that resonates, especially when combined with his obvious mystery and charisma. He's dancing along the precipice of evil, but in many different ways at many different times. Other characters sometimes seem like they're just becoming weaker or becoming stronger. Damon's a bit less unidirectional, and I think that's how we often feel ourselves. Let's dive a bit deeper into his charisma, because that doesn't depend so much on the complexity or the storytelling elements I've been describing. What is charisma, exactly? Well, it includes intelligence. Damon definitely has a natural intelligence. It also includes a grace, or some sort of mindless self-assuredness. He knows what he wants, and he goes after it, with no compunction. It's magnetic. That's what people like about Prince Oberyn. If you think about it, aside from the fact that he happens to be opposing what we all know to be a villainous house. Prince Oberyn's essentially on a pure and simple vengeance quest. It's an understandable one in response to the brutal killing of an innocent girl, but it's a vengeance quest nonetheless, for something that happened very long ago and that we don't really feel emotively connected to. So why do we like Oberyn initially? What about Elena Tyrell? What about Bronn? Why is Arya more magnetic than Sansa? Why is Tyrion more likable than Cersei? Well, I guess with the Lannisters, there are many, many complexities. You're not the Golden Lion. You're just a pink little man who's far too slow on the draw. But one significant point is that all these characters, like Damon, know who they are and they're quite open and pure about it. That's interesting. Pure. Damon wants power. Purely. He's emotional. Purely. He's impulsive, purely. But he's not some twisted, demented spider spinning in the shadows. He's confronted who he is, and that gives him a certain comfort and power and poise. So charisma is confidence. It's dangerous and convicted confidence with the potential for darkness as well as light. It's refreshing. In a world dominated so much by secret counsel and dark, long-drawn designs on power, Damon's just up front for everyone to see. Yeah, he enjoys power. Who doesn't? So he marches into the throne room with that crown to make a point. I'm popular, he says. I'm powerful. I'm dangerous. But I'm loyal. I bow to my brother. I spit upon the conniving spiders in their shadows. The face I show the realm, I also show my brother. And the face I show my brother, I also show the realm. I'm true. It gives him sort of a radiance that less self-actualized men, less honest men can never have. 
Their lack of honesty strips them of potency. Damon thunders from one undertaking to the next, sometimes broken, sometimes spurned, sometimes banished, but ever stronger in the long term, ever unshaken. The shadow-weaving spiders are unable to see their plans come to fruition in half the time because they're dependent on the weakness and corruption of so many other men around them. It's worth noting again that, as with suspense, Damon's aura diminishes somewhat as we get to know him. The more time we spend seeing him hugging his wife, teaching his daughters, engaged in petty arguments, the more we humanize him, the more he starts to lose this aura of charisma and shrouded mystery. If you're watching a court scene and then boom, he cuts someone's head off, you think immediately, wow, now there's a badass willing to change the pace of things. If we're watching a council scene and boom, he's stolen a dragon's egg, we think, wow, there's a badass willing to change the pace of things. But imagine if it was told from his perspective. Imagine if there was a day spent discussing the stealing of the egg with Masaria. Then there's a day spent flying down from Dragonstone, convincing the dragon keepers to let him in, flying back and telling his men to prepare the fortress. It would all seem a bit less badass. This happens all the time in story. It's an inevitability as we start to bond with a character. Consider any character that starts out with anything like an aura of awesomeness in some arena. As we get to know them, that aura is diminished. We feel it with Jamie Lannister and his abilities. We feel it with Melisandre and hers. We fill it with Danny's dragons. We fill it with the Hound. We will fill it with Aemond and with Vagar soon. We will continue to feel it with Daemon. In that vein, I would have liked to see a bit more compassion for Daemon's children, and I would have liked to see why his sons and daughters have turned out so well while Alicent and Viserys' have not. Apparently there were some scenes that were cut, in which he comforts his daughters after his mother's death. I've mentioned elsewhere that I would have liked to see another episode or something in that middle section of the series after the first time jump, but before the second, when all the children are just children. You get the sense that Viserys and Alicent's relationship is weary and strained. Their children are lonely and a bit messed up, while Rhaenyra's by Harwin are quite well. Harwin himself seems a noble and cheery fellow, a loving father, an excellent foundation. It also seems to be during this time that Rhaenyra matures a bit. She seems to appreciate a bit more deeply her role as a mother, as a daughter, and as an heir. She's already messed things up a good bit with her impulsiveness, betting who she wishes and not very discreetly. There are definitely arguments to be made against her here. As a man and a gay man, Lenor didn't really have consequences to his actions, so it could be argued that it's easier for him to remain blame-free throughout the entire thing. Rhaenyra, though, is the heiress and Viserys' daughter, and she does have to ask herself whether all the suffering brought about by her infidelity is worth her own personal desires with Harwin. Of course, one could ask what would have happened if she hadn't born an heir by the time Alicent's children po started popping out. Would Viserys have changed his mind? Should he have? Might Rhaenyra's tryst with Harwin actually have been better than the alternative? Couldn't she have at least fallen in love with someone with dark skin to make things a bit more believable? All these sorts of questions are what make House of the Dragon so delightful. But I was talking about how I'd like to have seen more, a bit more, from this middle section. Damon was already a much-loved and increasingly empathetic character, even by this time in episodes 3 and 4 and so on. But until this point, his actions were still largely fiendish, with only glimpses of compassion and restraint thrown in. Fatherhood, and perhaps the simple passage of years and the weakening of his brother, seems to have matured him a bit, softened him. This is what we love. We love real characters. He's always loved his family, in his way. Even in opposing his brother early on, he's stabilizing the realm and protecting his brother's name. It's due in great part to Daemon's strength that Viserys was able to die Viserys the Peaceful, king to a unified rather than a fractured realm. He loved Masaria, a whore. He loved his niece, and he was true about it. He loves dragons. He faces armies alone. He walks the deep places of the earth, sings ancient songs by torchlight, and wakes the sleeping, unclaimed dragons. He's audacious and ambitious, devilish yet true, unpredictable and cunning. In short, he typifies the Westerosi hero, or perhaps the necessary dark side of the Westerosi hero. Some may have conviction and nobility, but lack his fire and his cunning. These will find themselves crushed by the savagery of life, unable to realize their true heroic potential. Others may have the fire and cunning, but lack the conviction and nobility. These cannot live truly, cannot love truly, and can honor no true code. They too will find themselves crushed. Crushed by those of yet greater ambition. Crushed by those with greater friends. Crushed by those with a higher code. 
Damon, though, he has the cunning and the fire, but he shows openness to the virtue. His convictions, even where corrupt, are always true. And as he grows and hurts and risks losing those that might be close to him, he learns to love. He learns, perhaps, something of the way of virtue. He at least searches for the path. So the Westerosi hero is a complex thing, a thing by necessity both dark and light, fiery yet flexible, grim but hopeful. Understanding the true path is a never-ending journey, one made dark and convoluted by the cruelty and scarcity of the world. So even if he's not yet the perfect Westerosi hero, the point is we don't even know exactly what that means, what that would look like. Damon's trying to find it, though. He's trying to live it in his way, and he's doing so more freely or perhaps more openly than any other character. That's why, with all his charisma and audacity and bloody ambition, with all his Martinesque contradictions, Damon captures us most of all.